I was born in 1976 in Zimbabwe, just on the cusp of independence. So I grew up in an independent Zimbabwe. Um, I lived in Harare. My father was a civil servant. Um, went to uh, went to a mission boarding school, and then studied film. At, uh, it's, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was called Vision Valley Film Institute. And then in 2002, I came to England, where I've lived ever since. No, I think it was just always there. It started off, my earliest writing would have been, I used to, I used to write my own episodes of the TV shows that we used to watch, you know, like 240 Robert, Knight Rider. Uh, they might still be around because I know my father kept some of these and it just sort of grew from there. I just had this um, thing about writing stories. I haven't counted them because you know now we live in an age where you don't actually have sometimes you don't have books you've got you know like digital editions so you know it's it's hard to say I, I, I don't know how many books I've written <laughs> sorry first book was um, The Man Who Turned Into a Rastafarian it was a collection of short stories uh, about well it's based mostly on some of my own and uh, you know those of others um, the experiences of the Rastafarian people in Zimbabwe and it was it got international acclaim because there, there isn't a lot of literature about the Rastafarian people um, especially in the fiction genre so it did attract a lot of attention um, well I've never thought about it I do try and experiment with different forms, um, so I, I wouldn't say no, I don't have a specific writing style. I'm sure there's a, there's a common element in all of them, but um, I do try and different ways of telling a story. I wrote that on a day. You know, it started off with uh, someone saying that it's impossible to write what they call complicated stuff in a local language. So I wrote, um, it's, it's about 70,000 words, really. Yeah, it's about 70,000 words. Mm -hmm. A story about a biotech, a, a, a foreign company engaging in the illegal biotech experiments in Zimbabwe and the impact of these experiments on a local community and for that um, again there was a lot of international attention I think it was it was showcased last year in an exhibition on African science fiction in London I didn't know about it until I you know, I saw it on the internet <laughs> so there has been a lot of attention what is tell it limited is that soon after after it came out Amazon discontinued it um, in the Kindle series because they say that they don't support certain languages as e-books. But I'm pleased to say that there's now finally um, a Zimbabwean business that is set up to publish e-books. So it will be available again to the e-book reading um, community. I would say they're realistic. I would say they're speculative. Mm -hmm. You know, I I ask the question, what if, and then explore that. So you have a situation like in Munah Chamay I was saying, what would happen if a company um, was to conduct experiments which are banned in, say, the United States? They would do them in Zimbabwe, and then I set up the situation that they're able to get away with it because one, they can maybe. Um, bribe their way in. We do have a problem with corruption. We might not be comfortable talking about it. Well, we do have one. They're able to bribe their way into the country. Number two, because um, a lot of people wouldn't actually know what's going on. They would actually participate. You know, we live in an age where uh, we're keen to get foreign investment. We're keen to get, you know, um, sci um, scientific investment. So people would be excited to have a whole lab being built in the rural area somewhere without realizing that it's actually a destructive force. Another topic that I, highly, that I was talking about in that novel was how food security can actually be a weapon against nations 
or it can strengthen a nation. And I'm warning Zimbabwe that we need to wake up. Uh, Zimbabwe achieved a lot in the area of food security development and then, well, as we all know, that isn't the case now. And we can't, we can't afford to be in that situation where we're going to grow cash crops, but we can't feed ourselves. So these are some of the issues then that I was highlighting. Then of course I went on into what would happen in the story, um, because the, um, there's the chemicals leaking into the ecosystem mm -hmm. and creatures are going big, you know, the fish in the river have become so big that they start attacking people. But these are simple villagers and their first thought is, it's a mermaid. So again, I'm saying people need to go outside of what they know and understand. You know, the world's now much bigger than a mermaid in a pool. So there's a correlation between biotech experiments, the controversy around the ethics around biotechnology and genetic modification, and a mermaid in a pool. Um, you can think of Frankenstein, mm -hmm. um, which for me was where um, horror and science fiction split. Um, into two different genres, but again carrying the same theme, speculation, fear. Fear is a very real theme, in, and for us as, um, as a people, as Zimbabweans, we've had this uncertainty for close to two decades now. You know, the fear of the future, the fear of what's going to happen. If you look throughout history, we've tended to use the language of horror to describe the real situations, uh, you know, about Dracula. The original Dracula was a nationalist figure known for his cruelty. And, you know, the vampire myth evolved at around that time. Today we talk, uh, the government of Mr. Mugabe talks about the demonization. You know, they talk about, oh, our government is being demonized. You're talking about demons now. You know, it's been made into a monster. So there isn't that. Um, there is a close relationship between horror, as in, you know, vampires and monsters and so on, which aren't real, and the fears that actually engender them. You know, there's a saying, the sleep of reason eats monsters. So I use, it's, I use metaphorical language in the horror stories to tell, um, you know, to depict reality. It's unfortunate that a lot of people I, maybe it's because of their religious beliefs, cannot tell the difference. I can't help these people. I get people writing to me and asking me for um, information about joining the Illuminati. And I have to tell them that the Illuminati doesn't exist, it's fiction. But the more I tell them, the more they are convinced that I am a member of the Illuminati and um, I'm so scared of our secret coming out that you know I'm trying to discourage them from, from joining it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, it's quite embarrassing because a lot of my family are staunch Christians and I think it's embarrassing for them. But this is the thing. Um, that's why I, I wrote the, this is the only non-fiction book I've ever written called um, the, greatest, um, uh, the Greatest Trick the Devil Ever Played, which explores um, in an academic way the roots of many of our popular beliefs about witches and monsters and devil worship and then to show that it's all fiction. I'm a writer of fiction. I think I'm the best person to tell you that. I know about these things, so trust me. You can trust me on that. Um, but it's not just that. I do cite sources in the, um, you know, like a very extensive list of um, how these ideas have emerged and why they are current and why they are believable. But I just want to say I am not a member of the Illuminati. Um, I am not a devil worshipper. Well, that, that surprised me because um, I, at that time I didn't engage with a lot of Zimbabwean readers. So I didn't even know anyone was reading. So that, that, was, uh, that, that was a huge honor. Thank you very much. And to all those who voted for um, Well, there are a lot of, because I am a white reader, I've read everything. Stephen King, this one, and even the older masters, you know, the, um, 
Lovecraft, Edgar Allan Poe, and all these. I would say if there was a single text that I could point at and say major influence, it would have to be Decolonizing the Mind by Mugi Wakano, because it, it ties, um, well, it, it ties our situation, you know, as Africans in a, in a world where it's English that dominates and English culture, and then being able to navigate in that world. There's a lot of them, really, because uh, you know, I've been reading since from an early age. I started reading earlier than a lot of people, and I know it was, a, it was abnormal because my parents had freaked them out. At first my father thought I was pretending, and he tested me um, when he came home from work and my mom reported. Because my mom literally froze like that when she saw me reading, because I was reading out aloud. So I must have been too young to have been able to read. You know, she just looked in horror a lot. And then when, when my father came back, they started arguing about it. And then he tested me and he thought, okay, yeah, you know, I really actually can read. So from that age, I've just been exposed to a lot of different writers. A lot of different writers. Um, the list is long, I think. I couldn't name anyone, really. Um, I do read a lot of Stephen King. But then again, the thing with Stephen King is that he himself went through that same path. So when you read Stephen King's books, you get to know other different writers. He will quote from them. Like, you can see the influence as well when you get to read them. So you know, I've, I've had a very eclectic background. It don't have to be the authors from Zimbabwe. And there's quite a few of those. Now I'm reading, there, there are more authors from Zimbabwe than when I was a child. So these should be supported and celebrated. Um, Tendai Uchu is based in, uh, he lives in England. Uh, no Violet, Bulawayo, the, um, we need new names. Chris Manalas. Um, well, I can think of so many names. There's, there, there's a lot of authors coming up. Project. Right, the first one, that's the one that's happening online at the moment. It's called Herbert Wants to Come Home. It's, um, it's multi-layered. The first part is it's a, it's a vampire story about a Zimbabwean man who dies mysteriously and then he's repatriated to Zimbabwe. He dies mysteriously in England after a visit to Romania. But under the surface, it's a story about us Zimbabweans who have lived in exile and are struggling to navigate our way back to Zimbabwe. So, um, well, I've, had it, I've been writing it and posting um, chapters on what is called the Juke Pop Serials, which is an online publishing platform. Uh, well, first of all, write. That's the only. That's the most important thing. If you're a writer, you write. That's. Well, that's nothing more needs to be um, said after that. Yeah, but having said that, anyway, even though I said nothing more needs to be said, um, I think a writer has to work in that social media environment. You need your website. You need your Facebook page. You need your blog. You need your Twitter. We live in that age where these are necessary tools. And not just necessary tools to get you published, but can themselves offer a publishing platform that will pay.
Now, there are a lot of writers who have not and they have not got themselves a publishing deal, but are still able to make a living from writing for the internet. Uh, that would depend on their individual circumstances, because some, some writers, well, the thing is, you know, it's, it's like the music industry, isn't it? Some people have just go with a shtick. If someone's written a, a successful inspirational book, then theoretically I should write the same and make us, you know, the same amount of money. But the way these things work is sometimes you might have a better way of telling a story than I do. So even if, if we wrote the same novel, then yours would sell more and yours would get more praise, whereas mine, no one, you know, even wants to read. That's just how it is. So I think every writer has to constantly reevaluate themselves where they are in terms of their market. This is where the social media comes in because through social media you get to know who your readers are. That's how, you know, I've, I've just said that a lot of my readers are women. I only found that out through the social media interaction. There are a lot of, and yet when I set out to write, I, I never said I was going to write for women, you know, which is interesting. I'm not going to change my style to suit, but it was just, you know, something that, it was an eye-opener. I didn't know who's, who reads my work, but, uh, so that would be a very important thing for aspiring writers, is to, you know, engage with social media. So aspiring writers today also have to recognize that it, the traditional publishing model has changed. So getting rejections from um, from the publishing companies doesn't mean that your work is unpublishable. There are always options. And the thing with the options is that if you have, if you go the self-publishing route, uh, before when it started there were loads of these like rogue companies preying on aspiring writers and making lots of money. But today you can set up a publishing platform for free. And the way it works is that if you if you manage to generate interest, then that tells you that, okay, even if such a publisher turned you down, there are still people out there who will read your book and are willing to pay it. So that's the beauty of it. It's not as closed a world as it was 10 years ago. So for a lot of writers, I just say, just put your work out there. Mm-hmm.